The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. The speaker today is Richard LaRouche. He's from the Department of Public Health at the University. He's interested in the physical activity of children, and I guess he does it to himself because I was informed he's done Trans Canada on a bicycle from one end to the other. So I'll invite Richard up and start his speech. Right, uh, uh, thank you everyone for coming today and thanks for the introduction. So, Alright, so I'm going to start by discussing about uh, physical activity and why we have a problem with physical activity uh, in children and youth uh, around the world. Uh, uh, before uh, going into discussing about independent mobility, uh, what it is, uh, why it matters, and um, and what are the, the factors that are associated with children's independent mobility. So, uh, so first of all, this uh, slide shows um, uh, rates of uh, physical uh, inactivity among children and youth uh, uh, across the world. So, so this is the proportion of, uh, of children who are not meeting physical activity guidelines. Uh, for children and youth, those guidelines are 60 uh, minutes uh, per day of physical activity and you can see in blue uh, the countries where uh, uh, less than 60% uh, of kids are physically inactive. I don't know for you, maybe it's my glasses, but I don't see many countries in blue. Um, most of the countries have uh, around 80% of, um, of, of children who are not uh, meeting those guidelines. And this is a problem because physical inactivity is known to be associated with many diseases. Those include uh, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and some uh, types of cancer. And now I'm going to move on to uh, one type of physical activity, that is active transportation, a bit like uh, uh, cycling across Canada, but it doesn't have to be across uh, uh, the country. Uh, so active transportation merely involves going from point A to point B uh, actively. And those are surveys in different countries around the world where they looked at the proportion of children who use active modes such, such as walking and cycling to get to and from school. And those surveys were done at different uh, times. And I connected the dots here to, to show you the, the trends. So, uh, so what you see in most of these uh, countries is a a decline uh, over a period of uh, several decades in the proportion of uh, children who use active transportation uh, to school. So the Canadian uh, data are in red uh, here, so the, the decline is fairly uh, modest here, but we don't have uh, good uh, uh, data that goes back to say the 1960s, 1970s and so on, where um, presumably the, this proportion would have been higher then. But if we look at uh, in Canada across a longer period of time, so this is a study that was done in the Greater Toronto uh, area by some of my colleagues. So they found that 58% um, uh, of parents that were surveyed uh, use active transportation to get to and from school. And when they asked the same parents uh, how their children uh, travel to school nowadays, only 28% said that their children engage in active transportation. So basically, in the span of uh, over a, a generation, we've uh, gone from uh, uh, children who were walking to school uh, uphill, both ways, in, in the snow, barefoot, with uh, 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 wild animals and what, uh, what not, uh, to uh, bubble wrap uh, children, essentially, that are, uh, are uh, protected from, uh, from uh, everything that might happen. <laughs> And one of the uh, key determinants of active transportation is independent mobility. So independent mobility is the amount of children, uh, sorry, the amount of freedom that children have to explore their neighborhood without adult supervision. And this is um, an image that was published in the Daily Mail in the UK. Uh, I think it does a great job at showing uh, how independent mobility has shrinked over time. So you see the, the larger perimeter that is shown on the screen is the uh, independent mobility of the great-grandfather was allowed to go 
uh, about six miles away from the, their house to, uh, to go fishing with uh, friends uh, at a young age. And what you see is that with uh, each successive generation, the amount of independent mobility uh, shrinks uh, to the point where you have the, the children uh, today that is uh, only allowed to go about uh, 100 yards or, or less than 100 meters away from their home. And so uh, another landmark study that was done in the UK looked at the percentage of kids who were allowed to travel home uh, from school uh, on their own. Uh, so in 1971, this uh, percentage was 80%, and in 1990, it uh, was down to 9%. So, uh, so a, a very large uh, change over the course of a single generation. And this is not something that is unique to the UK, so there has been uh, studies like this that have been conducted in many different uh, countries uh, such as Australia, uh, United States, uh, Finland and Germany that consistently indicates that over the course of time there has been a decline in children's independent mobility. In Canada we don't have good historical data about uh, independent mobility. Maybe this was not something that we uh, measured back in the 1970s or 1980s because we, uh, it was not necessarily a concern. Uh, um, uh, children were sent out uh, uh, and they were told to come back for lunch and to come back for dinner and, uh, and to go to, to bed. So, uh, uh, so back in the day, it used to be the norm that children had independent mobility. And uh, it's only now that it has become a problem that we uh, researchers are focusing uh, on it. And those declines are, are concerning because independent mobility is associated with active transportation, as I was uh, uh, saying with the previous slide, but it's, it's also associated with uh, uh, overall physical activity uh, is associated with uh, playing outdoors uh, as well, which is an important source of activity for children. And the benefits are not just about physical activity, uh, there can also be benefits in terms of cognitive development and neighborhood uh, perceptions. And this is a, a qualitative study that, um, uh, that looked at um, uh, children's perception of their, their neighborhoods and their environmental uh, knowledge about their neighborhood. And, and this uh, map that you see is a map that was drawn from a, uh, by, a child, uh, by a child sorry, that had limited uh, independent mobility. So you see that it is not very detailed. You see the, uh, the street where the child uh, lives, but it, it is not uh, connected with the rest of the city, for example, where the, the child goes to school. And there's a footnote that you cannot uh, see really well on the slide that suggests that there is uh, uh, a lot of traffic and that is uh, a, a major concern and that the, uh, the cars go fast and they don't stop for, for uh, uh, children to, to pass when they have priority. And uh, to compare that, we have a, a map that was drawn by, by a child who has a greater independent mobility. Uh, we were able to see uh, much more details. And if you look at, um, at the perception of the, the neighborhood in the article, there are much more uh, positive perceptions of the, the neighborhood. And uh, what the, this study, among others, uh, suggests is that children with greater independent mobility have better uh, wayfinding skills. To, uh, uh, they are uh, better able to go from point A to point uh, B, uh, and so uh, this is uh, something that contributes to their cognitive development, not just to their physical activity. And what about the parents? And so the parents are thought to be the primary gatekeepers uh, uh, of their child's independent mobility. Uh, they're the ones who make decisions about whether they, uh, they allow independent mobility or not for their children. And uh, parents make decisions about whether they grant independent mobility or not uh, based on characteristics of the neighborhood, concerns about, uh, about traffic safety, personal safety, and so, uh, so on. But uh, if they make the decision that their child needs to be accompanied on the way uh, to school, um, uh, it's likely that they're going to be accompanied by car, so they're going to be driven uh, to school. And uh, it is often uh, a task that the mother uh, is responsible uh, for doing, uh, at least in uh, English-speaking countries like uh, uh, Australia, uh, Canada, and uh, the U.S., according to, uh, to a study that, were, uh, that was uh, done ac across uh, different uh, countries. And so the, 
uh, the parents uh, um, have to spend a lot of time playing the role of taxi driver to uh, suffering their children to not only to school but also to, uh, uh, to sport practice and to other re recreational venues. So last year there was a, a paper that uh, came out in one of the big pediatrics journals, the Journal of Pediatrics, uh, that made uh, the case that uh, um, uh, over the period of, uh, of the, um, a few decades there has been um, uh, this decline in independent mobility that I've been uh, discussing about in the previous uh, minute that uh, happened at the same time as there was uh, a major increase in the uh, proportion of um, uh, of children and, and youth who have uh, mental health uh, challenges, um, the, those uh, associated with anxiety, depression, uh, even suicide. And so they made the, uh, the case that these uh, two things could be linked, that, uh, that um, the decline in independent mobility could be uh, one of the potential causes of this increase in mental health uh, disorders among children and uh, adolescents. However, when they um, uh, published this uh, commentary, uh, uh, longitudinal evidence was lacking. So they had on the one hand uh, studies showing a decline in independent mobility, on the other hand studies showing increases in mental health disorders, but uh, 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 they were not able to uh, connect the dots between, uh, between those uh, uh, studies because uh, 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 longitudinal studies of independent mobility um, looking at its relationship with uh, mental health have not been conducted. Uh, so this is what we um, uh, a gap that we tried to address with a, a study that we had already uh, conducted uh, uh, across uh, Canada during uh, the pandemic that is called the uh, Active Transportation and Independent Mobility uh, Study Two. So it, it's called Study Two because there was a study one uh, before that that we uh, we did about uh, seven or eight years ago in the three different regions of Canada. Uh, but this study was a. Uh, a national longitudinal study, so we worked uh, uh, during the pandemic with a market survey firm uh, called Leger, and so Leger recruited for us um, a sample of uh, about 2,300 uh, parents of children uh, aged 7 to 12 across Canada, so we have representation from all of the provinces uh, across the, the country, and every six months those same parents were invited to take part in, uh, in a follow-up service. So the surveys uh, did look at independent mobility, active transportation, and many other uh, variables that I will not be discussing today. We looked at overall physical activity, we looked at um, uh, screen time, uh, sleep, and uh, other variables as well. And so this sample is representative of Canadian parents with um, uh, children in our target age range, so 7 to 12, uh, based on characteristics such as education uh, and um, uh, also in and so this study started in December 2020, that was the second wave of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, so it's uh, important to take that into account. So, so this is one of the periods where the COVID-19 restrictions were the most uh, uh, severe. And over the 18-month uh, the uh, period of our, uh, our study, uh, there was a decline in the, in the restrictions that were put in place to address the, the pandemic. So that's what you can see uh, on this slide. So uh, higher numbers represent uh, uh, more restrictions that were uh, implemented. So, uh, so the first uh, uh, bar is our, our, our baseline survey in December 2020, and the last one is our last survey that we did uh, in June 2022, uh, when most of the restrictions were lifted. And for assessing uh, independent mobility, we used uh, two different methods. So we used um, uh, the first uh, one that was used in the, uh, the British study that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, that was uh, developed by Mayor Ilman and colleagues, uh, who uh, has uh, six uh, what they call mobility licenses, so, so it's an analogy that they make between uh, driving licenses and, and, and the permission for, for children to do some things on their own. So those are the six uh, licenses, so travel to and from school uh, on their own, uh, crossing main roads, uh, cycling on main roads, going out after dark, uh, these sort of things. And so what we uh, do uh, with this uh, question is that we add the number of permissions uh, from zero to six, and so this uh, gives us um, a scale that, that represent the, um, the amount of independent mobility that uh, children have. 
Our next measure is even simpler. So we ask uh, parents uh, how far uh, their children are allowed to go on their own or with uh, friends or, or siblings. And so uh, this is called home range. So, uh, and so we, uh, we use uh, three categories in our paper. So, so those were allowed to uh, go less than five minutes uh, away from their own, uh, five to 15 minutes and over 15 minutes. And so now the, uh, the question that, um, that we uh, try to look at in relation to mental health, so is children in a band mobility associated with uh, distress? Uh, so we had a measure of parent reported child uh, distress, which uh, is sometimes referred to as the distress uh, thermometer because it, it asks parents uh, on a scale of zero to 10 how much uh, distress their children has been experiencing uh, lately. And so this is the, the measure that we add uh, in our study. It's, it's not a perfect measure. It doesn't ad address uh, 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 all different types of mental health issues, such as uh, anxious disorders, uh, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress, and all of that. It is just um, an overall uh, measure of the amount of distress that the, the child experienced. Uh, but this measure has been validated against uh, a much more uh, detailed scale that is used to assess uh, uh, anxiety and, and depression. And so uh, based on the, the previous validation study, uh, we uh, classified uh, our participants who had a score of four or more on this um, indicator of distress as having elevated uh, distress. And on this uh, slide, you see the, the um, percentage of, um, of parents who told us that their child had elevated distress uh, at the different time points in our study. So, so at the baseline survey in December 2020, it was a little bit more than half of parents who told us that their, their children uh, had high levels of distress. So, uh, so this is a, a worrying uh, finding. The, the, this uh, percentage is probably higher than I would have expected. Uh, you can see that it, it decreases as the study uh, progressed. Uh, uh, which is intuitive, so you, you, one would expect that with uh, the removal of uh, COVID-19 uh, restriction, it, uh, it probably contributed to improve um, uh, children's uh, mental health. So this was a, an online uh, survey that we did with uh, parents uh, during the COVID-19 because there was those COVID restrictions, so we were not able to, uh, to meet those parents uh, in person. So. Uh, so with an online uh, survey, we experience uh, a relatively large uh, dropout rate, which is um, uh, understandable in the context. Um, uh, so this is what we're reporting at the top of the, this slide. And you also have information about the um, uh, levels of independent mobility, so the, uh, the percentage of children who had uh, no more uh, than two uh, mobility licenses decreased uh, over time. And this makes sense because during the study, it was um, about the same uh, children. So those children were getting older. And so with age, you tend to see an increase in independent mobility. So that, that, uh, that makes sense. And those are, are our main uh, results. There's uh, a summarized in, in text uh, here. I have all the numbers if, uh, if some people are interested in those. They're in the, the published uh, paper as well. And so uh, what we found f uh, first was that uh, mobility licenses were not associated with the amount of distress that uh, parents reported. However, when we look at the home range, we, we did see an association. So, uh, so compared to the children who had uh, the smallest home range, so those that were allowed to travel uh, no more than five minutes away from their own, uh, those that were allowed to travel uh, five to 15 minutes away from their own, at 24% uh, lower odds of uh, uh, high levels of distress, and those were allowed to travel um, over 15 minutes at 40% uh, uh, lower odds of elevated distress. And so this is uh, <coughs> controlling for a bunch of other uh, variables that could be associated with the amount of distress that uh, children may experience. So we control for all of these variables that are, are discussed uh, here. So. Um, uh, so we, we found that uh, uh, the odds of having elevated distress were uh, lower at the follow-ups compared to the baseline that was December 2020 when the restrictions were at, um, the most severe. So, so this is uh, intuitive. We, we also found higher levels of distress in older uh, children, so, uh, so those children that were closer to the age of puberty. We found no difference in levels of distress between uh, boys and girls. 
uh, but we did uh, found higher levels of distress in, in children who at the time of the survey attended school um, in a mode that is uh, different from the, the, the typical in-person mode. So those that attended school online or that attended school in a blended format, so maybe some days it was online and some days it was in person, uh, those uh, children had uh, higher levels of distress compared to those attending uh, in person, uh, which uh, is in line with what uh, many psychologists and, uh, and child development exper experts um, um, were worried about with respect to uh, COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, we also found that uh, levels of distress were higher uh, in children from lower income families, which is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, was um, uh, foreseeable as well. And so uh, to discuss our findings, so we found that mobility licenses were not associated with child distress, but home range was associated, so maybe it's not necessarily uh, so much about what children are allowed to do on their own, but it's more about um, uh, the, the extent of the uh, children's overall um, independent mobility, so those who had higher home range maybe had the ability to see their friends uh, more uh, during the pandemic, which is something that was um, that is important for, uh, for coping and for, for mental health uh, in general. We found that our, our results were similar when we uh, repeated the analysis that I presented uh, separately for boys and girls. We got essentially the, the same results and the same variables that were associated with the level of distress of the children. And uh, one thing to, to note when we looked at the, the statistics, the, the, uh, the strength of the association between home range and distress uh, was uh, uh, roughly similar to uh, the strength as as association of uh, attending school um, in an online or blended format or, or being uh, in a low income household compared to a high income household. So it was a fairly substantial association. And these results have implications for future uh, pandemics that are likely to happen more frequently in the context of uh, climate change uh, moving forward. And so now the question is where do we go from here? Uh, how can we support uh, children to have higher independent mobility than they currently have? So, uh, so this is the, the direction where uh, our research is going uh, right now. I'm going to present some uh, factors associated with independent mobility at the baseline survey that we did in December 2020 and discuss about uh, um, uh, some uh, ongoing studies that are, uh, are going on in my lab. And really, the, the take-home message is that uh, it takes a village to raise a, a child, and, uh, and in uh, the context uh, of uh, physical activity research, the, the way we uh, operationalize this uh, uh, village is to look at uh, different levels of influence that can uh, influence a child's independent mobility. So, uh, so in the center of the model, you have uh, uh, personal characteristics, uh, such as characteristics of the child, you know, the uh, child uh, age, uh, uh, gender, the, uh, uh, motivation, and whatnot, and, and uh, as you go to the uh, outer layer of this uh, model, which is a bit like a, like a, uh, you know an onion that has different uh, types of layers, you you get to, to more distant uh, uh, things that can uh, uh, still influence their children's uh, independent mobility. So you have the first characteristics of the. Uh, the parents, so the parents are uh, key decision makers that will determine uh, how far children can go on their own uh, or if they can travel to school, um, among other things. Uh, and next we have characteristics of the community in which the, the child uh, lives. Uh, you have characteristics of the, um, uh, the built environment, so the, the human-made features of the environment, such as the presence of uh, sidewalks and traffic calming measures and uh, walking and cycling infrastructure and whatnot. And let's see, you have uh, public policy, which is really important because it can shape all of the other layers uh, of influence. So the policies will uh, will decide uh, how the uh, environment is uh, structured. They will have an influence on, on schools and other settings in, in which uh, uh, children spend their time. So this is how we looked uh, at it. and. To, uh, to summarize uh, the findings in a, in a descriptive way, this table shows uh, for each of the, the different levels of influence the characteristics that were associated 
uh, with uh, more uh, independent mobility. Uh, again, our first survey that was done in December uh, 2020. So what you can see here at the individual level, for example, is that uh, uh, boys had higher levels of independent mobility compared to girls. Uh, independent mobility was uh, higher among older children, as one would expect. Um, it was uh, higher in children that did not uh, have a disability or a chronic uh, condition or that had a mobile phone, and I will come back to this uh, phone issue a little bit later because it's a tricky one. And next, if you look at the interpersonal level, there is a, a lot of variables that, um, that were significant at that level. I think it goes to show the influence that parents have on their, their children's independent mobility. So, so children had more independent mobility uh, when the, uh, the parent who completed the survey identified as men, uh, when the parent uh, worked uh, full-time uh, rather than part-time or uh, being a student or uh, other types of uh, occupations. Um, uh, there was also higher independent mobility when uh, parents engaged in active transportation to work or, or school, uh, when uh, parents own fewer uh, motorized uh, vehicles, uh, when they uh, own a dog, so maybe it, uh, uh, dog walking is, uh, could be a way to support uh, independent mobility, so parents may feel safer if their children is walking with a dog compared to walking along. Uh, so, uh, so these are some of the factors that uh, came up. Uh, in the uh, level of community, uh, and these were perceptions of the parents about uh, uh, traffic uh, uh, safety concern and crime safety concerns, so, so both types of cancer, uh, concerns were associated uh, with independent mobility. And we also see some uh, the difference between regions of Canada, so children have higher independent mobility uh, in the Prairie province as well as in Quebec uh, compared to Atlantic uh, provinces. And uh, Ontario and British Columbia uh, were not different from the Atlantic provinces. Now what about the phones? So I, I, I mentioned I will come back to that because the uh, it's a tricky qu uh, question. Uh, I'm not sure I would su necessarily support that we equip children uh, with phones because the, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So, uh, uh, our findings are consistent with previous research suggesting that children who have uh, phones have higher independent mobility. But uh, we know that uh, uh, phones uh, uh, can be used by, by parents as a sur surveillance uh, tool. And so this raises the question of whether it's really independent mobility uh, or not. And we also know that phones are important sources of uh, screen time, which is uh, uh, something that is associated uh, with uh, less physical activity. So um, excessive screen time is associated uh, with uh, obesity and cardiovascular risk, among other things. And so uh, more recently, we did uh, a quite a good study in southern Alberta where we interviewed uh, parents to, to find out more about um, uh, their perceptions related to their child's independent mobility. And so the, uh, the parents were uh, uh, aware of uh, the pros and cons of, uh, of phones in the context of independent mobility. And um, there was uh, even a few parents who uh, mentioned strategies such as using uh, walkie-talkies who don't have the same tracking ability as phones, but that can uh, allow a way for parents uh, and children to stay in contact if uh, needed. So in conclusion, so, uh, so uh, our findings may uh, influence uh, future studies and interventions that will uh, aim to promote um, independent mobility and active transportation in children and youth. So based on the results that, uh, that I presented, uh, intervention should target uh, uh, multiple levels of uh, influence of the model that I showed you because there was uh, uh, characteristics of the child, characteristics of the parents, characteristics of the community, and um, uh, the built environment that were uh, associated uh, with uh, uh, independent mobility, as I showed you, but uh, these characteristics were uh, uh, also often associated with active transportation and uh, other papers that we uh, published from this uh, uh, research. Uh, I didn't uh, stress that when I, I showed uh, the table a few slides ago, but we uh, saw that parents who had higher tolerance to risk for their children, um, that was associated with higher independent mobility. Uh, so my colleague Marina Brussoni at the University of British Columbia has developed um, a tool that can um, help parents uh, reframe their perceptions of, of risk. Uh, one example of that is about uh, climbing trees, so at what point do you intervene as a, as a parent? So if, if gradually uh, you uh, 
uh, you postpone the uh, the height at which you intervene as a parent. It can allow uh, children to, to develop their um, uh, their abilities and their independent mobility. So uh, so this is a, an interesting tool. So the website is outsideplay.ca. Uh, Another approach could be to promote active transition to, uh, to school and work because we saw that when uh, parents uh, uh, use active transportation to, to work, the, uh, their children were more likely to use active transportation to school and to have higher independent mobility. So, and most of the existing interventions that promote active transportation in children and uh, youth uh, don't really focus on, on parents' transportation, and so this is uh, uh, an area for, uh, for future work. Another uh, area is to address parental safety concerns. So we saw that both uh, uh, concern about traffic safety but concern about crime safety as well were associated with less independent mobility. So, uh, uh, so this is something that uh, needs to be addressed. There's probably a role for the media in this regard because sometimes when the, uh, there is a situation that involves risk, you hear about the, uh, this situation across many media platforms and sometimes uh, uh, media reports can be uh, uh, sensationalistic and make people believe that uh, uh, that the world is more uh, dangerous than it actually is. Uh, encouraging dog walking could also be a way to support independent mobility based uh, on findings I presented, but also findings uh, of other studies that have supported that. And uh, for increasing active transportation, increasing walkability, which is the um, uh, characteristics of the neighborhood that support uh, walking, uh, such as the presence of walking infrastructure, but also uh, having uh, connections bet uh, between the infrastructure, having uh, destinations that are uh, uh, close by that can be reached by walking or cycling, uh, can uh, support active transportation. And lastly, we need uh, research to. Um, uh, to examine how to uh, support independent mobility, uh, particularly among children uh, with disabilities and among uh, girls, which in our study had lower levels of independent mobility. So future work on independent mobility. So uh, one of my current master's student, uh, Slipta Roy, is working uh, uh, on a paper right now that looks at uh, uh, not just the factors associated with independent mobility at the baseline survey, what I presented a few minutes ago, but she's working at the factors associated with changes in independent mobility. So, so, so this will allow us to see what, what are the characteristics that are associated with uh, increases in independent mobility uh, over time. So, so this uh, work is uh, uh, ongoing and can uh, help us provide uh, uh, more uh, stronger evidence to support uh, future uh, interventions, future uh, programs or policies that could be developed to support uh, independent mobility. And often, uh, uh, supporting uh, independent mobility is not is not something that you you, you flick on and off like a, a light switch. Uh, 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 children will develop their independent mobility uh, gradually, uh, step by, uh, by step, so, and it can start with uh, a conversation. Uh, with parents uh, or grandparents for, for that matter. And here I want to highlight a, a documentary that my colleague uh, Guy Faulkner, also at the University of British Columbia, uh, produced about uh, five years ago. It's called uh, Running Free and it's uh, available uh, to stream on YouTube or uh, other platforms for free. And I would like to acknowledge my, uh, my teams. So on the top row, you see my co investigators on the project that I presented. Uh, uh, today, you also see uh, some uh, current and former uh, graduate students uh, uh, from my lab. So, so this work would have not have been uh, possible without the contribution of uh, many uh, different people. And with that, I would like to, uh, to thank you for uh, listening and invite you to ask uh, any questions. And you also have um, uh, a book on active translation that I published about uh, six years ago and a website of my research group that is uh, mentioned there. I read Henning to it. My name is Kurt Peterson. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for coming to SACPA and telling us uh, that we need to stay active. Uh, I remember when I was a young man, I, you know, 
it was uphill both ways, going to school for three kilometers, and in the rain and the snow, whatever you had, it, that's just the way it was. But I'm, I'm wondering if, if that generation had had the same electronic entertainment in their homes, whether we would have been as active as we were. I, I don't think it would have been any different. We would have, I remember when TV came along, I would go to the neighbor's house and watch through the window, black and white TV about this big. That was a, that was a big thing. Uh, do you think uh, today's generation has really changed that much? Or is it just the technology that has changed? I think it is both that does. Oh, <laughs> Thank you for the questions. I, I think it's uh, both that uh, have changed. So, uh, so the uh, the technology was um, was not as available uh, as if uh, 50, 60, 70 uh, uh, years ago. So uh, uh, so the, uh, there was less the, this incentive to be in front of uh, uh, screens and play uh, video games or or, or things uh, like that. So. Uh, so, so that that has changed over time, but uh, uh, but also uh, another thing that has uh, changed is um, uh, is pe uh, people's um, uh, attitudes and, and behaviors. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, as uh, we mentioned uh, before the, the presentation, I know some uh, as some of you came to, to to tell me before the presentation that uh, uh, you were thinking about the, the good old days when uh, uh, you could. Um, uh, play outside, and parents will tell you to come ba uh, back for lunch, come back for dinner, and come back to uh, to go to to bed. Uh, uh, that would have been the uh, the norm at at some point, but uh, those norms have changed, and and uh, and so now, nowadays it it would be um, an exception rather than the norm to to, to have to, uh, those types of practices. Hi, my name is Henning Mundell, and I have sort of two conceptual uh, queries. One is uh, with the, all these studies, especially the longitudinal ones, already showed the trends over decades. Yep. Do you know from any of the data what the relationship is in relation to our ur increasing urbanization versus the farm life where it's for example, young people working on the farms as young kids and so on. It's not considered work, it's just family life. And uh, the, the increased mobility that used to be there when we had a higher percentage of uh, uh, rural communities, farming communities. And the other one is, uh, I like the, uh, the term, yes, it takes a village, but uh, in the so-called developing countries where uh, the relationship, the families, and so on. And, uh, you know, grandparents live uh, so many kilometers down that way, uncle down that way, and uh, yeah. moving around. Whether there's any of these studies that relate relate to different countries, different regions of the world, other than the specific Western countries that you've quoted. That's two very good uh, questions. Uh, thank you so much. So. Uh, uh, so for the first one about uh, differences between uh, urban uh, and rural areas, uh, uh, I think urbanization could could have played a role uh, in there. So so there is research to suggest that um, uh, children in rural areas may have uh, higher independent mobility, uh, more more permissions to access the things on their own. The, the literature is not. Uh, 100% uh, consistent in that regard, but but, but yes, th this can be uh, one of the, uh, the factors that is involved uh, uh, with that, with uh, uh, ur urban areas that might be characterized at the other end as having uh, higher levels of, of traffic that will, uh, can deter parents from granting independent mobility to their child. So, so, so that's what uh, I would say in that regard. And with respect to comparison b between uh, countries, I'm, I'm glad that um, uh, you brought this topic because this is a, 
uh, direction that my work is uh, going right now. So uh, I'm, right now I'm, I'm uh, doing a study. It is not about independent mobility. It's about physical activity and different uh, types of physical activity across uh, 14 countries um, uh, uh, and probably more because some countries are, are joining with their own uh, funding. But uh, um, uh, we're uh, doing this study to develop a new physical activity questionnaire. But at the same time, it will give us a, a way to compare different types of, um, of physical activity between countries. And uh, this project involves not only Western countries, but also uh, lower uh, and middle income countries that uh, where the context is completely uh, different. So, uh, so in, in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, or Asia or, or South America, it's uh, um, the, the reason why people do things are, are different. So, uh, so people uh, uh, may be active uh, there because that's a necessity. They, they need to get from point A to, uh, to point B and they don't have a motorized option. So, so they have to, uh, to walk and people will walk or run or, or bike uh, long distances in some of those uh, uh, countries compared to us. My name is Bob Campbell. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I'm kind of the same generation as Knud. Uh, he said he walked three kilometers. I walked three miles, so I went far. <laughs> just, just so you know. And it was uphill both ways. <laughs> My question concerns, and you alluded to it somewhat, but it surprises me where I live here in the southern, southern part of the city. Uh, I see parents driving their children to school, and they only live three blocks from school. It, it, just, it just boggles my mind. But when you talk to parents, a lot of them say they're, they're afraid. They want their kid, they, they have this their sense of fear that something's going to happen. My understanding is that the risks are extremely low. You know, the whole thing about crime and crime rates, uh, my understanding, crime rates overall are decreasing. Reporting of them is going up, and I think that's part of the problem. Uh, could you comment on that concept? Yeah, but, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I would agree uh, uh, with you that uh, if you look uh, over a period of decades, crime rates have, uh, have declined, but uh, sometimes we get the impression that it increased because the, uh, uh, it's the way it's reported uh, in the media that can uh, lead parents to uh, overestimate uh, the risk that um, uh, their children will face if they uh, were allowed to, uh, to walk to school or to, uh, to other uh, places and uh, and so and so I would agree and I think uh, with respect to the the distances uh, uh, I think a lot of it is uh, is a matter of uh, social norms which uh, have uh, changed uh, uh, over time so uh, so three kilometers or, or three miles w would have been an acceptable uh, distance I'm not too sure about the uphill both ways but I can certainly attest that when I was a a child, uh, there was a steep uphill to, to, to go back home. There was downhill to go back uh, to school, though. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, so, uh, so those social norms uh, vary by, uh, by countries. And, um, uh, and uh, traveling three kilometers by, by walking or, uh, or biking is something that is uh, still being done in, in, the, uh, in countries such as Finland and Sweden and, and Denmark. Uh, who are also northern countries, they also have a winter, they, uh, they are, uh, are also high-income countries, but uh, there the social norm is, is different, so, uh, uh, so it, um, it um, encourages us to, to find uh, out uh, who could be able to recreate uh, that here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very interesting. Um, as the other speakers have said, we, most of us in this room grew up with a huge range fostering high independent mobility. <clears throat> um, I walked to school, often I would ride my bike, and I was even entrusted with um, giving my younger sister, who was in kindergarten, a ride on the back of my bike. So we, we had a great deal of mobility. I'm just wondering about the demographics of the population that you study versus our population. Because um, when I was a kid, <clears throat> it was just the beginning of the baby boom, so we were, there were very few kids, very few kids, and most of the population was adults or elders, 
because uh, so many people had been lost, many men had been lost, and women, during World War II. So it was, a, it was an older population, there were few of us. So I wondered about that. Um, I wondered now <clears throat> at the value of kids when you have, when you have a whole a big family of 10 or more kids, and you have kids walking to school together, and now you have one or two kids, is the value of kids more important now? And um, when I was a kid, any elder in the community could come up and chastise you. They'd say, you, you didn't, you know, don't you look at me like that. Or make sure you walk, make sure you stop before you walk across the street or whatever. They would chastise you. Well, now, if you chastise a child, you're facing a lawsuit. So, uh, so the whole community was involved in uh, raising the kids, as Henning was talking about. Uh, I was quite interested in your stats about the better educated, uh, richer families, um, kids who attended school more time, um, um, having, having a greater, greater range. And uh, I just wondered, perhaps where you're, you're measuring, when you measure distress, you're measuring parental distress rather than children distress that is projected upon the children. And uh, I wonder how you would plan to get at that with some questionnaires on uh, the myths that these families are involved in, such as um, a stranger danger, when in fact most, most um, perpetration happens within families. Thank you. Thank you. So, so that's that's a lot, and I, I struggle with uh, when there is uh, five um, questions. I will try. I will try to co uh, comment uh, uh, on some of them, and, and if uh, if I don't re respond to one of your questions, you can remind me if that's okay. Okay. Demographics. Yeah. So so the demographics. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think the, um, uh, nowadays we people have um, uh, smaller families, so there is less um, uh, children. Um, around in proportion of the, the total uh, population that that's what uh, uh, I think uh, but uh, I think having uh, siblings uh, is an important uh, variable so uh, so when we did there quite a study where we in, in, uh, interviewed uh, parents in southern Alberta um, one of the things that they told us is when the um, uh, the child that they were interviewed about had an uh, older sister or older brother, it could help with uh, independent mobility, uh, but when they had uh, a younger sibling that they were responsible uh, uh, for, uh, it could uh, reduce independent mobility if, if the parent was uh, said, well, um, okay, so my, my child was a, a nine or ten years old, might be correct and, um, on his own, but, uh, but since is with uh, their, their five or six year old uh, sibling, uh, uh, it makes me more concerned. And so, uh, so, uh, so uh, siblings, it, I think it depends on the on the age of the, the child. When uh, when I take my sister on the bike, I'd swear to secrecy if we went somewhere where we weren't supposed to go. <laughs> okay, uh, and parental distress. Yeah, the, uh, so for, for parental distress, yes, uh, so there is the possibility that uh, um, because we ask parents about the, the distress, the, it's the perception of the parents. It could be different from uh, the amount of distress that their child actually experienced. So, so, so I would agree um, uh, with that. Uh, that's that, that's, that's a, a limitation of the, the study that um, uh, we could not uh, uh, interview the, the children uh, in person in that context because it was working with a market survey firm, so they only do surveys with adults, and so it's not it's not something we, we could address. But we uh, we did add, add items about uh, about perceived uh, uh, crime safety that uh, that that came up as one of the factors that were associated with uh, less in the mobility. Myrna Crawford. Um, in your drawing the map of the community by the children, uh, what ages were those maps representative of what age of children? Those two different maps of their community that they drew. And um, could you also speak to if your research included uh, differences between 
um, our seasons. Um, right now we're in the grips of winter, but there is a big difference in the um, uh, type of environment the children operate in in the summertime. Could you speak to both of those, how your research was included? Yes, uh, thank you for, uh, for the question. So for the, um, uh, the study where I showed the, the maps, it is a study that was uh, conducted by a researcher in the United States. I was not involved in the, the study at, at all. Uh, I remember that those were, uh, were primary school age uh, children. I, I couldn't uh, exactly pinpoint uh, what age unless I, uh, I could look it up on, on the internet. Uh, and then for the, um, uh, the seasons, I, I think uh, um, uh, we see some, uh, some changes in, in physical activity b uh, between seasons. Uh, uh, sometimes the, uh, children tend to be less active in the winter, especially when it's uh, cold like the, uh, this morning. Uh, with respect to independent mobility, um, there might be a bit less the differences because it is about what, what children are allowed to uh, to do and not necessarily about what they're doing today so uh, so they might st still be uh, allowed to uh, uh, to go five or ten or fifteen minutes away from their own but today they might choose not to do it and so this will impact or reduce their physical activity my name is mark gettle you've touched upon this a little bit but how do you dissect parental induced distress in children versus mobility induced uh, 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 mobility induced uh, stress so I'm thinking those parents that are paranoid helicopter parents will induce stress in the children if you cross the street you're going to get hit by a car um, you know uh, don't speak to speak uh, don't speak to strangers and all this type of stuff if they are distressed already about uh, what could happen to the children I'm sure that where's but that affects the children and causes stress themselves. Um, so how do you dissect the fact that those parents that are restricting mobility are not inducing distress, not because they're not mobile, the children, but because the children are under this stress that the parents are inducing on them? That's a very good uh, question. That's, uh, that's uh, certainly uh, a challenge. So uh, uh, so in our study, the, uh, the distress uh, question was uh, very uh, general about the, the amount of distress that they experience um, uh, in general versus the, um, uh, the, the questions about uh, independent mobility were more uh, pointed. So, um, uh, so I, I think the, uh, these are, are different things that, that we're, we're measuring. Do I, do I, I would uh, uh, agree that um, that um, maybe it reduces our ability to see significant uh, differences if, if part of the distress that, um, that parents are, are reporting uh, about uh, um, uh, is about children's mobility because it, it could be about many different things. It could be about, uh, uh, about um, their children being anxious or, or uh, uh, having, uh, uh, making nightmares or, 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 or whatnot. So, so the, the distress is much uh, Brother. I get to a moderator's question. Oh, somebody else is coming up. Um, my job uh, involved putting together a lot of injured children for many years. And what I've noticed is there's been a change in playgrounds. Some have been ripped out and made safer. I almost wonder there's a consequence where you're not learning pain and you shouldn't do that and you just don't have a perception of what your limits are when you make them too safe. Yeah, very good question. How safe is to, too safe? And uh, uh, and so I was in, uh, involved um, almost 10 years ago. Uh, we put uh, together a, a position statement on active outdoor play that, um, uh, that was uh, a statement that we put together with uh, uh, a multidisciplinary group of experts uh, from different parts of Canada and different uh, disciplines. So, uh, so people representing schools, representing uh, uh, public health, the fiscal activity sector, the uh, uh, law sector. So, 
So, uh, and this vision statement uh, is, uh, is that um, uh, active play uh, with its risk uh, should be uh, uh, supported uh, in different environments uh, at home, at school, and in the in the community. So, uh, because there is this um, uh, this question that, like you said, of uh, surplus safety, if I can use the, uh, this term, that we're trying to uh, to bring the risk down to zero, but we are developing um, uh, playgrounds that can be uh, boring for uh, for children. And if children are bored, they uh, they might uh, find a, a way to to make it uh, risky, uh, nevertheless. So uh, uh, so it, it might not uh, necessarily solve solve the uh, the problem of uh, injury and. Uh, and one of my uh, colleague Mariana Brusoni, who, who I uh, quoted in my presentation, she uh, she does research in, in this uh, area, and uh, and they did a review, and they found that uh, risky play was um, uh, was not associated with uh, with more injuries. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mary Shillington. Thank you for the presentation. I got me thinking about uh, being the youngest of three uh, females in our family. And I know that I got a lot more privileges as the youngest because uh, my parents were wearing down in their <laughs> enthusiasm about putting so many borders on us. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, when you did your research, were you looking at uh, not only the gender of the children, but also on where they came in the birth order uh, and how many children there were. And uh, uh, I, I remember my sister uh, not wanting to stay home at night and look after me, so she bribed me. I could play the piano and I'd get a chocolate bar when she came home when she was supposed to be home all the time. Uh, <laughs> so some of those things are very interesting, and I'm wondering. Uh, about the birth order and the number of children, if that was part of your research. So. Yes, uh, thank you for, for the question. We, um, uh, we did have a question about um, uh, how many children were in the household, but, uh, but we, we don't have a question about, about the birth uh, order. I would agree it, it could make a, a, a difference, and, uh, uh, and what I was uh, thinking was that uh, as, a, as a parent, you, you might be um, uh, more protective when it's the first uh, child. You're concerned about uh, uh, about whatever could happen, and, and maybe by the time it's the third or fourth uh, child, you you might come to to realize that um, uh, a lot of the, those risks are overstated, and uh, and maybe you might uh, grant more independent mobility. So, so I, I think this is something that will will be worth uh, future research. I was granted one more question. Uh, many years ago, we had uh, Sergio Pellas come speak at SACPA more than 10 years ago about the importance of rough and tumble play. And I think it can be argued that when people are independent, they are playing together without parental guidance. That comes into play. Whereas with, with parents are watching all of them, they're not going to let them do rough and tumble play at per, per se. So could you comment on that, please? Yes, I think uh, those are, are two concepts that are, are likely to be um, uh, interrelated. So, uh, uh, so the, the children who have uh, higher independent mobility are, are likely to be uh, those children who have the ability to engage m uh, more in, in rough and tumble play because the, um, uh, parents are putting less restriction. It's, uh, uh, it's less likely that they will be uh, able to uh, to intervene and, and stop um, this type of, uh, of play uh, when they're not uh, not, uh, not present. So, uh, so, so I think it's uh, uh, rough and double play is one, one of the types of uh, risky play. So, um, um, independent mobility is is also considered within the umbrella of uh, of risky play as uh, as play where the the child has there is a 
possibility that they will uh, get lost. So the, so the possibility exists. Mo most of the time they will not get, get lost, but, but yeah, so it's one of the types of risky play. Another could be playing uh, with, with tools uh, like, like uh, scissors and hammers and nails and uh, things like that. So, 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 so lots of closely related uh, concepts. Well, thank you, Dr. LaRouche. Our speaker next week is Troy Hicks, Downtown Fire Safety and What is Everyone's Role in Fire Prevention. Do you have a take home message for our group? That's a, it's a good question, but uh, I think, um, like I said, the bad mobility is, is not like sw uh, switching um, a light on and off. I, I think it's. Um, it's good to, to build it in, in small uh, steps and so when, when we asked parents in, in southern Alberta how they supported their children in pen mobility, um, those who did support it uh, uh, sometimes told us about the small steps that they, they made. So, so sometimes a small step was, well first of all you, uh, you might uh, uh, go to school uh, with the child um, close by and then uh, uh, you might uh, gradually uh, walk behind uh, uh, the child so you can see that the child is crossing the road uh, uh, safely and those sort of things and then uh, gradually you put more uh, distance so that um, uh, uh, so, so, so that the, the child uh, develops the, uh, the ability to, to have uh, more independent mobility. Thank you.